You are now tuned into the Black Law Students Association of Canada's YouTube. Starting with the appellants. I'll be speaking first, and I'd like to take uh, 20 minutes if you don't mind. I'm Grace Chloe. And the, the second speaker. Uh, hi, my name is Emily Bielich. Um, I'll be also taking 20 minutes and I will be speaking to section 15 and Grace Chloe's speaking to section seven. And the respondent starting with the speaker one. I will be speaking first for 20 minutes. Okay. And the second respondent, if you could just introduce um, yourself. Sarah Kahn. Okay. And I will be speaking for 25 minutes, and I'm the respondent. Okay. Awesome, thank you. So we can begin with the first team whenever you're ready. Good morning, Justices. My name is Grace Chloe Lumbala, and I'm here today with my co-counsel, Emily Bealish, to represent the appellant, Mr. Williams. Today, we are here to discuss the government's responsibility to provide equitable health care services despite the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. I will be discussing the issue as it pertains to Section 7 of the Canadian Charter. My co-counsel will follow while referring to Section 15. In this case, the Minister of Health's data collection policy, which fails to collect disaggregated race-based data, is an infringement on Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights to life and security of the person under the Charter. We have four submissions on this issue. Three are doctrinal and one is theoretical. First, the collection of disaggregated race-based data is essential to the provision of timely and effective health care to Black Canadians like Mr. Williams during the COVID-19 pandemic. Second, our theoretical submission is that the Section 7 analysis requires an approach which acknowledges that neglecting to provide for the specific needs of marginalized individuals can lead to an infringement of their Section 7 rights. And so this court must acknowledge that equality is a principle of fundamental justice. Third, the COVID-19 pandemic is the unique circumstance that the courts have been waiting for in order to impose positive obligations on the government under Section 7. And finally, the minister's infringement on the appellant's Section 7 rights to life and security of the person is not justified under Section 1 of the Charter. Now allow me to begin with my first submission. There's no arguing that the COVID-19 virus is a significant health threat to us all. Not only has it been found to have long lasting effects on certain individuals, but it has also led to the death of thousands of Canadians. The issue is even more pressing for individuals who are part of racialized groups, such as Mr. Williams. These groups are at a higher risk of public health outbreaks because of the systemic racism and discrimination present in Canada. Race-based data collected in the United States has identified that Black Americans contract and die from COVID-19 at a higher rate than any other racial group. Similarly, the death rates of Black people in the United Kingdom have risen dramatically compared to those of white British, excuse me, compared to those of white British citizens. Without collecting DRBD, disaggregated race-based data, the Canadian government remains blind to the effect of the pandemic on Black Canadians. This will lead to further ineffective policy decisions regarding healthcare resource allocation during a time when resources are scarce. If the government allows for such a thing to happen, they will be putting individuals in the Black community, such as Mr. Williams, at risk, and the risks are fatal. At paragraph 12 of our factum, we discuss the case of Shaoli and Quebec. In it, the concurring opinion found that the security of the person is engaged when patients are denied timely health care for condition that is clinically significant to their current and future health. And the right to life is engaged when a lack of timely health care can result in death. Therefore, in this case, there has been a breach to Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights to life and security of the person. <laughs> 
Mr. Williams maintains that the minister's data collection policy arbitrarily limits his rights and therefore fails to comply with the principles of fundamental justice. The respondent submits at paragraph 50 of their factum that the minister's objective would be to would be preserving the health of all people living in Canada through this urgent time, which means not collecting disaggregated race-based data in order to focus on more immediate needs. The government cannot successfully preserve the health of all people living in Canada if it overlooks the disparate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on racialized groups. Therefore, the policy's objective is not rationally connected to the risk it imposes on Mr. Williams' life contrary to the rule against arbitrariness. Furthermore, through Shaoli, we know that the rule against arbitrariness is engaged in the context of healthcare when a policy is manifestly unfair. It was found in Morgenthaler that limits on security of the person brought about by rules which endanger health are manifestly unfair. The minister's data collection policy endangers the health of black Canadians like Mr. Williams because it will lead to a lack of timely healthcare services endangering his health. For my second submission, we're going to jump to paragraph 25 of the factum, which addresses our theoretical submission, which is that the minister's data collection policy is not in accordance with equality, a principle of fundamental justice. Canada's population is growing more diverse, and therefore there is an urgent need to recognize that equality is a principle of fundamental justice. This would allow for those who suffer inequities, such as racial minorities, like Mr. Williams, to participate fully in the enjoyment of Section 7 rights by addressing gaps in public policy and legislation. In order to be a principle of fundamental justice, a rule or principle must fulfill three criteria. First, it must be a legal principle. The general acceptance of a principle among reasonable people is an important component of a principle of fundamental justice because it ensures that the decision maker is not the only one who sees the principle as fundamental to the legal system. In her article published in 2020, Susie Flader writes that some judges will be more willing than others to make connections between the pre-existing principles of fundamental justice and the disadvantaged circumstances of some claimants. As a result, the principle of equality is, become more, is becoming more widely accepted. The second criteria requires that the legal principle is one where a significant societal consensus is drawn that the proposed principle is fundamental to the way our legal system ought to operate. Over the years, many marginalized groups have come before the courts to demand, to demand rights and ensure that they are being treated equitably. The Supreme Court of Canada has made many pioneering decisions which recognize the importance of equality in a just and fair society. Recognition of equality as a principle of fundamental justice would ensure that this value, which is already central to Canadian jurisprudence, continues to animate Section 7 litigation. So, so counsel, if I can just ask you, you their argument with respect to Section 7, uh, when you suggest that the court needs to acknowledge equality as a principle of fundamental justice. Why does Section 7 not already include the fact that or the consideration that a person be considered according to their circumstances, those being all of the factors that make that person a whole being, such that you're arguing uh, consider this person's uh, socioeconomic situation. How is that divorced from Section 7 as it currently exists? As, uh, thank you for your question, Justice. As it currently exists, Section 7 has too high of a focus on, um, or rather the focus when looking at the two-step test in Section 7 on the deprivation to the individual is on the state's action, rather than acknowledging that the state is overlooking the systemic barriers that are keeping the individual from being able to access um, public services provided by the state. Continue. Thank you, Justice. Uh, the final criteria uh, to for this principle is that it must be precise in order to create a manageable standard against which to measure deprivations of life 
liberty or security of the person. Uh, in her article, Flater describes that by nature, section seven is highly individual, individualized. And this works well with the academic and judicial recognition that, it, that individuals have distinct needs. At the heart of this argument is a concept of equality, which is intersectional and inclusive of the various barriers that individuals face when attempting to protect their charter rights. Equality as a principle of fundamental justice would enforce more consistent contextual analyses of the social and economic factors that have contributed to a claimant's deprivations. My third submission is that although positive obligations have yet to be imposed on the government under Section 7, the courts have suggested that such a thing could be done in a sufficiently special circumstance. You can follow along at around paragraph 23 of our factum. Um, Gosselin in Quebec was a Supreme Court of Canada case involving a claim under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter to a right to adequate social assistance. In it, the court found that although the imposition of positive obligations on the government under Section 7 is unprecedented, it can occur in circumstances the court deems to be sufficiently special, leaving open the door to the possibility of the future imposition of positive obligations on the government under Section 7. More recently, in Tanujaya in Canada, the court struck down a Section 7 positive rights claim but it explicitly refused to do so on the basis that it was a Section 7 positive rights claim. The court maintained, once again, that positive obligations could be imposed in circumstances a court would deem to be sufficiently special. The courts have displayed a continued willingness to leave the door open, and the time to step through that door is now. It cannot be said enough how special the circumstances of this pandemic are. The pandemic has come upon us suddenly and is a mortal danger to people across the globe. Each nation has had to come up with its response and Canada's response is incomplete if it does not acknowledge the plight of racialized groups. This is a unique circumstance in which the court must step in to ensure the protection of charter rights, whether or not this imposes a positive obligation on the government. Justice Arbor's dissent, yes, Justice. I just keep going back to uh, Justice Brown's decision where she specifically addresses uh, the, the applicant seeking to impose a positive obligation on the minister to collect this data. And her findings were the scope is too wide and the costs would be, or so far haven't been decided who would bear the cost for that. So what do you say to Justice Brown in her decision on that point, counsel. On that point that the costs are mm -hmm. too high? Well, frankly, that the scope is too wide. How are you going to define the scope of the data that is collected and who should bear the costs? Well, the we are asking for um, disaggregated race-based data to be collected. And uh, the government has had a history of collecting demographic information that has to do with race. The issue at bar here is that they are not doing so while collecting data that has to do with the effects of the pandemic on the population, which is overlooking the effects the COVID-19 pandemic is having on uh, Mr. Williams. And so to, we're concerned Mr. Williams is concerned by the justice's statement that the, the costs are too high to um, provide to, to provide a healthcare service which addresses the needs of Canada's marginalized population. Um, we cannot allow um, Canada to, to the government of Canada to simply shrug off the duty that they have to their marginalized population because the costs are quote unquote too high. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this a political decision that should be made though or is it a, a decision that the court should make? It's a decision that the court should definitely make because it is, um, as I've said before, uh, not in compliance with uh, the charter and the, 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 um, the courts, the judges in the courts are guardians of the charter. Thank you. 
Thank you, Justice. Justice Arbor's dissent in Goslin was correct in stating that in certain contexts, when a state makes the choice to legislate over a certain matter, this can constitute state action giving rise to a positive obligation under Section 7. Mr. Williams' claim concerns a health care policy administered in a manner that does not comply with the Charter in the context of a pandemic where said violation risks his life. He asked that this court acknowledge that this circumstance is sufficiently special and should give rise to the imposition of, po of a positive obligation on the government. My fourth and final submission is that the policies limit on Mr. Williams section seven rights is not justified under section one, according to the two prong test from the Queen and Oaks. Efficient data collection in a timely manner in order to preserve the health of all Canadians is an essential component to uh, the pandemic response. Mr. Williams concedes that the objective is pressing and substantial. However, the current data collection policy is not demonstrably justified as it fails all three steps of the second prong of the Oaks test. In this case, there is no rational connection between not collecting DRBD and preserving the health of all Canadians. As a black man, Mr. Williams faces barriers to accessing healthcare, which will not be taken into account when the government distributes healthcare resources in accordance with a strategy that is not informed by DRBD. Mr. Williams is at a greater risk for COVID and has a more immediate need than the majority that the data collection policy is catering to. Therefore, the policy will not be fulfilling its objective of preserving the health of all Canadians. Looking at other jurisdictions informs us that in the case of this policy, that in this case, this policy is not minimally impairing. The fact that other governments, um, the other governments engage in the collection of DRBD reinforces that its collection is, via, is a viable alternative to the current policy that would be less impairing to Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights and the achieve the goal. Sorry, Council. Can we just look at the other the other jurisdictions that are that are collecting this data and how do they compare to the Canadian reality? Um, the other jurisdictions that I have mentioned are the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, which have a similar history of uh, a similar colonial history um, that is tied to the um, the the that is tied to the experience of racism on Black Canadians, that Black Canadians experience today. And my co-counsel will have more to say on this particular issue. Thank you. Of course, Justice. So um, Council, I just I just have one question. I'm not sure if you're yes, in a justice. position to answer this, but you have indicated um, repeatedly the fact that Mr. Williams is a Black male and he, um, and you've made the comments about marginalized communities and the fact that um, they are especially vulnerable to COVID-19, but I'm not seeing the connection between Mr. Williams and how he, or where like any background about Mr. Williams in terms of what his socioeconomic status is and how he might fall into um, a community such as what you've been advocating for. For example, an indigenous community who lives in a remote northern area is, um, it, it might be different than say Mr. Williams, if Mr. Williams is a CEO of a company and has millions of dollars and is able to afford private healthcare should he choose. I mean, are you able to assist in that regard? Um, I, I will do my best justice. And all I have to say on that issue is that, um, we have gone through four levels of the courts to address this issue. The issue being the, 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 the way that the government is overlooking the systemic barriers that black people are facing to accessing um, equitable healthcare services. Um, the issue that the government is overlooking the, are going to overlook racialized groups in their pandemic response strategies, and that this is imposing a risk to Mr. Williams' rights as a black man. Um, this is no trivial issue, and it is Mr. Williams' position that it is so important that he, he is here today because it is clearly affecting him. Thank uh, you. 
of course, justice. As I was saying, um, um, I'll just repeat myself. Uh, the fact that other governments engage in the co collection of uh, DRBD reinforces that its collection is a viable alternative to the current policy that would be less impairing to Mr. Williams' Section 7 rights and it would achieve the goal of preserving the health of all people living in Canada. Collecting data which does not highlight the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black Canadians cannot result in the provision of adequate health care to these individuals and will lead to greater mortality rates in their communities. It's clear then that the data collection policy's deleterious effects are not outweighed by its salutary effects. And as I see, I'm down to less than one minute. I will just briefly conclude justices. Um, Mr. Williams asks that the court would acknowledge that his claim is no trivial matter. By imposing a positive obligation on the government under section seven, this court will be saving the lives of many by ensuring that no one in this nation is overlooked or forgotten in the COVID-19 pandemic. Subject to any further questions, justices, those are my submissions. Thank you, Kelly. Thank, Thank you. you. As soon as the justices are ready, I can proceed with the appellate's section 15-1 submissions. Proceed. Thank you. As my co-counsel mentioned, the respondent has failed in their duty to responsibly provide equitable pandemic health care. But more importantly, this case is about the people whom they have failed. They have failed Black Canadians, and we are here today to achieve justice for this group of individuals. And although the narrative is that Canada does not have the same problems as our neighbours to the South, it is time to critically examine the systemic issues present within our own nation brought to light by the federal government's treatment of Mr. Williams. I have three points to make today. First, there is systemic discrimination within the legal system itself because it is inaccessible to those in need of justice. Second, the government's denial of the benefit of equitably provided pandemic health care infringes Mr. Williams' Section 15-1 right. And third, this infringement cannot be justified under Section 1. Moving first to my theoretical argument at paragraph 44 of the appellant's factum. In order for justice to be meaningful, it must be accessible. And currently it is not, especially to marginalized communities such as Black Canadians. Um, these marginalized communities are, in the words of Bruce Ryder, the chief intended beneficiaries of the charter and also the least able to afford to pursue charter litigation. This does not accord with the principle of substantive equality, which is at the heart of section 15 and animates section 15 claims. This is because the legal system is designed for and by those already in positions of power within society. And historically, this did not include populations facing barriers due to class, uh, social status, race, et cetera. And while there is overt discrimination still present within the legal system, for example, in the Peters and Peel Law Association case, in which there's discrimination against two black lawyers, which the justice may be familiar with, this is also discussed in our factum. Mm -hmm. um, there are also, there's also discrimination present within the procedural elements of the legal system. So there's two elements that I would wish to mention today. That is the cost of charter proceedings and the evidentiary requirements for the admission of social science evidence. So first, relating to cost, Black Canadians have been hit harder both financially and health-wise by the pandemic. And this was conceded by the federal government in the House of Commons and this concession is present at paragraph 34 of our factum. Therefore, this marginalized community, many of these people are not in a position to bring exorbitantly expensive charter claims. And while Mr. Williams is here today, as one of the justices pointed out, this is by some miracle that he's managed to make it through four levels of court as a charter claim can cost upwards of $1 million if there's extensive evidence that needs to be called and this type of thing. There's some initiatives in place to address this, 
For example, the court challenges program, which was recently reinitiated. Re um, however, this seems to come and go depending on the government that's uh, currently in power. And there's also uh, requirements that uh, applicants for the funding are required to meet. Um, and the funding is also capped. So this program does have its limitations. There are some more uh, radical solutions such as the awarding of advanced costs. However, uh, there is a high threshold that the uh, applicant for advanced costs is required to meet um, and they must be unable to afford litigation. The claim must be of public importance and it must be prima facie meritorious. And as we discuss um, in our factum, it is, it, these are only awarded in exceptional circumstances. So if these requirements were relaxed in order to allow funding to uh, be more easily accessible to litigants, then Section 15.1 uh, claimants would bear less of a burden when attempting to have their charter rights adjudicated. A second procedural barrier present within the legal system is this, the high threshold for the admissibility of social science evidence through judicial notice. The appellants discuss this um, and citing the article by Agarwal and Lalani, which is present at tab two of our book of authorities. Um, these authors, as well as other commentators in the field, such as former Justice Leroux Dubay and Professor Graham Maida, advocate for a more flexible approach to judicial notice uh, within the context of equality claims. And this is because the onus is entirely on the applicant to demonstrate and prove the context of their situation. And often this is a marginalized person who is attempting to have their charter rights outlined for them, going up against almost always a government who has nearly unlimited resources. This is why commentators have argued for a more flexible approach to judicial notice um, and this being influenced, for example, by the human rights context in which the admission of social science evidence is uh, balanced against fairness to both sides and concerns such as this rather than the strict test outlined in the Queen and Find for judicial notice in uh, the court of law context, which requires facts to be nearly indisputable and not the subject of reasonable debate among, among people. This is not a realistic standard to expect a claimant to meet, especially in a time such as Mr. Williams has presented um, as social science evidence regarding the pandemic. And as we all know, information regarding COVID-19 is constantly evolving and changing as new knowledge comes to light. And this threshold is there, therefore very difficult for him to meet. And would, he, would, he would benefit and many other marginalized rights claimants would benefit from a relaxed approach to judicial notice, especially in the context of equality rights claims. So, so counsel, I'm trying to understand from this argument, both with respect to costs and with respect to uh, taking judicial notice in terms of evidence, how has your client's case been impaired by those two factors? Thank you for the question, Justice. And I, I believe it was brought up earlier that um, we don't have a lot of facts surrounding Mr. Williams' particular situation, but this uh, works both ways. We're not sure if this claim has bankrupted him or how he has managed to come by enough money to move this claim through so many levels of court. And it has taken quite a, I'm assuming quite a, quite a long time to do so. And although Mr. Williams has managed to do this, he is a black Canadian. And as I mentioned before, the government's conceded that Black Canadians have been harder hit financially by this pandemic. Therefore, many of people who are disproportionately impacted and likely suffering the disadvantages that they possessed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to the pandemic's burdens upon them and are not likely to be able to bring these claims, people in Mr. Williams' community, his friends and family, may be suffering so greatly that they are not able to bring claims before the court. And although he is somehow here, this serves to demonstrate my point that we need to relax these standards because otherwise claimants are not going to be able to bring these claims. And we're not sure how many rights claimants um, have not been able to bring their claims and have their rights adjudicated because of these barriers. Perhaps I'll rephrase. In this particular case, um, let's assume Mr. Williams uh, it 
has had a high financial burden in getting to this court. What are you asking this court to do specifically? What are you asking this court to consider um, rather than um, this high level of evidence? What do you want us to consider in order to advance your client's position? Uh, specifically, if the court could consider um, relaxing the test for the awarding of advanced costs, uh, which the government awards to, to the claimant typically, that is one possible solution. And another possible solution to consider is uh, relaxing the standard for the admission of social science evidence, not, not uh, requiring it to be indisputable, especially in the context of a claim that involves a scientifically evolving phenomena such as uh, COVID-19. Does that answer your question, Justice? Uh, yes, it does. I, 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 I'm just looking at the material you provided. You've got material from the World Health Organization, which I would not expect the respondent to argue is of lesser evidentiary quality. So I was wondering specifically to this case, what it is you have submitted that perhaps may not meet that standard. But I understand your point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it to my friends. I'm sure they have submissions regarding um, their points on the admissibility of the evidence that the, uh, the appellants have put forward. However, um, even reports that are submitted by, for example, uh, the United Nations, we submitted one report by them and then uh, from various health organizations and for example, the United States, um, this currently may not meet the standard required for judicial notice of social science evidence because these facts are not have not yet been proven to be indisputable, especially because, as I mentioned, we're currently learning more and more every day regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on marginalized populations. Moving now to my doctrinal submissions present at paragraph 29 of the appellant's factum. The minister has denied Mr. Williams the right to fairly benefit from the law, contrary to section 15.1. This has occurred through the adverse effects discrimination of the minister's data collection policy. So adverse effects discrimination occurs when a policy um, on its face appears to impact all those it, it touches equally. In effect, it operates to deprive certain individuals within that group of the equal of equal benefit from that service. So this was famously at issue in Eldridge, a case in which the Supreme Court of Canada found that deaf patients were entitled to interpretation services in order to equally benefit from health care. And was more recently discussed by the SEC again in the case of Fraser, which involved the RCMP's pension policy and its adverse effects on women. So just as the constitution protects against discrimination based on sex and disability, it also protects against discrimination based on race. And this is because section 15.1 has at its heart the notion of substantive equality, which recognizes that while a pension policy or healthcare policy may purport to treat all those effects, it affects equally, it, is, it, it in fact does not and as I mentioned earlier, operates to deprive certain individuals of equal benefit from that policy. The court in Fraser identified the work of Ebert and Stanton on equality rights to succinctly describe this form of discrimination as there being no single identifiable villain and that this discrimination involves an invisible power structure that is a powerful limit for those who do not have the characteristics the structure is designed to benefit. So just as in Eldridge, deaf patients did not have the characteristics that the stru healthcare structure at the time was designed to benefit. Now Mr. Williams does not have the characteristics that the current healthcare structure is designed to benefit. And the added level, as the added level of service in Eldridge was interpretation, the added level, level of service needed here for Mr. Williams to equitably benefit from healthcare is the collection of disaggregated race-based data. Council, I'm going to I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked your colleague, and, and it goes back to, again, isn't this a political decision? Uh, because as the majority of the Supreme Court uh, found in their decision, the collection of this data, while it can have obviously the effect that you're suggesting, it also has the possibility to have a significantly negative effect. And is that something that the court should be 
into, uh, the court should be ordering or is that something that that our political machine should be talking about discussing and determining whether it's the appropriate step forward I take your point, Justice, and I was uh, conscious of your raising of this issue earlier and the majority, uh, the majority in the court below's opinion on this as well. Uh, first, re uh, with, result with regard to the question of whether this is a political issue, as we mentioned in our factum at paragraph 39, although it is important to take into account the division between the judiciary and the legislative and executive branches, Deference cannot lead to the judiciary, judiciary's abdication of their role, which is to delineate the content of charter rights. So a political question transcends into the judicial realm when the government has enacted a program or has taken action, or uh, in this case, inaction, which is not in compliance with the charter. And speaking also to the concern regarding um, whether this might open the floodgates to an increased amount of litigation or answering uh, po of political questions, um, I would point the court to uh, that similar concerns were articulated in um, the arguing of the Eldridge case. And that since then, there has not been a floodgate of uh, litigation opened regarding positive rights um, or positive obligations on the government to provide uh, certain services to individuals. And that the charter and the tests in each section operate as the filtering mechanism so as for that to not occur. So claimants do still have uh, quite a high bar to meet to have um, the charter litigation. Thank you. Thank you. So moving to the first step of the test for a section 15.1 infringement, Mr. Williams is differentially and negatively impacted based on the protected ground of race. And the court and Fraser identified that there are two types of evidence which are useful in coming to this determination. And those are the situation of the claimant group and the effect of the law or action. So speaking a bit first to the situation of black Canadians, as my co-counsel alluded to, uh, there's been judicial notice of colonialism, uh, the history of slavery in Canada, the discouragement of black immigration, um, and those historical factors have contributed to the way in which modern day so Canadian society treats um, its black citizens. So anti-black racism is, as I mentioned, notorious and generally accepted to receive judicial notice on multiple occasions. Black Canadians also, as we discuss paragraphs 35 to 37 of our factum, are discriminated against in the housing context, in hiring, they're more likely to be victims of crime and arrested, and face discrimination in almost every aspect of day-to-day -day life. The government has identified these factors as key drivers of the healthcare inequities that Black Canadians face today. So for example, they're more likely to develop certain conditions than non-Black Canadians. Uh, they're more likely to, likely to rate their mental health as poor more often. And of course, they have to deal with the intergenerational stress and trauma that result from dealing with individual and systemic racism and discrimination. The effect of this, of the minister's failure to collect DRBD segregated race-based data is that we cannot know the extent of these factors, pardon me, and how they interact with the COVID-19 pandemic. And that in light of these pre-existing inequities, which the pandemic has simply brought to light, the same pandemic response is being provided to Black Canadians as it is to those who are not uh, disproportionately disadvantaged. Moving to the second step of the test for section 15.1 infringement, the minister's failure to act perpetuates, exacerbates, and reinforces the disadvantage that Mr. Williams faces. As we mentioned earlier, uh, race-based data collected in the United States has pointed to the fact that Black Americans are dying at a higher rate than white Americans. And the United Nations Working Group of Experts report, which I mentioned earlier, states that failing to collect DRBD facilitates and conceals human rights violations against people of African descent globally, as existing desegregated data highlights the stark racial disparities in both infection and mortality. And although these, these reports are from other jurisdictions and may not point to the situation in Canada, although they are similarly situated, as my co-counsel mentioned, our own federal government has identified the need to do more. Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland in the House of Commons admitted that Black Canadians are harder hit financially and health-wise by the pandemic, 
and that the government believes that collecting DRBD is extremely important. So while my friends suggest at paragraph 18 of their factum that the court needs to give the government more time to figure out how to collect DRBD, Black Canadians do not have this time, according to these reports from other jurisdictions. We simply do not know in Canada the disproportionate impact because the government has not collected this data. So at this point, my friends proceed through the cap and law analysis regarding the second step of the Section 15.1 test. Uh, they have neglected to discuss the recent addition to the jurisprudence of Fraser, of Quebec and A, and of Tape Attat, um, nor the court's recent articulations regarding adverse effects discrimination. Um, the tests articulated in these cases are preferable in line with where the SEC is currently at regarding the notion of substantive equality as being at the heart of Section 15. So Ms. Bialik, I just want to take you back for a moment. So assuming that there is a duty on the Canadian government to obtain or extract said data as it relates to the disaggregated race-based um, data, how would you suggest or um, what, let me rephrase that, what suggestions would you have on how they could collect that data? How would they go about obtaining it? Thank you for the question, Justice. Uh, one example that the appellants point to is the collection of DRBD by the province of Ontario. This is done under the authority of their Anti-Racism Act, which was enacted in 2017, and specifies that the collection of this data is to uh, attack systemic racism within the province and to ameliorate the condition of disadvantaged populations such as Black Ontarians. And there are uh, many aspects within this act which uh, are particularly informative of the approach that the federal government could take. Uh, for example, the data collection is not entirely carried out by the government, which negates uh, my friend's concerns regarding the overly onerous uh, burden that this would play, collection would place on the government, because responsibility is um, delegated to various public, uh, public service organizations. So for example, um, education boards, health boards, um, hospitals, uh, all have the responsibility to collect this data, as well as various governmental ministries. This helps to uh, diffuse the burden that my friends have mentioned multiple times and allows for the collection of this data to be properly and quickly collected in order to identify the healthcare trends that are currently impacting Black Canadians. All right, thank you. Thank you. So as I was mentioning, uh, my friends- Thanks. Um, so I think, yeah, I, your time is up at this point. So I think we're gonna move on to the respondents. Uh, if, if I could just okay. have, um, I understand if there's no time left, if I could a few mom like, moments to conclude. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll leave the justices to refer to uh, paragraph 41 of our factum for the appellant's uh, section one submissions. And in conclusion, this court cannot allow the government to remain willfully blind to the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Black Canadians, such as Mr. Williams. Charter protection should not depend on the color of one's skin. Thank you. Those are the appellant submissions. Subject to any further questions. Thank you. Um, when the justices are ready, um, I'm ready to proceed with the respondents' submissions. Please proceed. Good morning, justices and friends. My name is Tanita Doma, and I'm appearing alongside my co-counsel, Sarah Khan, for the Minister of Health for Canada, the respondent. The appellant claims that this case is about systemic racism and the utility of disaggregated race-based data, <clears throat> pardon me, as a step towards equality. Instead, justices, the respondent submits that this case is about what Black patients actually need to navigate this pandemic. They know the role that systemic racism plays in their health care, and they know that their communities are suffering. They have made their concerns known to the federal government, to the point where Canada has now recognized the disproportionate impact of COVID on Black and other racialized communities, as well as the reality of systemic racism in Canada. 
At this point, the minister needs to focus on the ways that she and her government can serve Black communities directly, rather than collect more data which will tell her what the government already knows and what Black communities have been telling the government. The respondent's position on this matter is that the Supreme Court of Canada was correct in finding that the appellant section 7 and 15 charter rights were not violated. For the court's purposes, this is what we intend to argue today. I will outline our first two theoretical arguments from our factum, the first concerning the social determinants of health, and the second outlining the practical and logistical issues with data collection. I will then detail the respondent's first doctrinal submission, which is that the appellant's section 15 charter right was not violated. My co-counsel, Ms. Khan, will then present the respondent's third and final theoretical argument, which outlines the potential for the misuse of race-based data. Ms. Khan will then take the court through the respondent submissions on why Mr. Williams' Section 7 charter right was not violated, and our final submission that any charter violations are justified through the application of Section 1. The respondent's first submission begins at paragraph 10 of the respondent's factum and states that the social determinants of health should be the minister's primary focus in navigating the COVID-19 pandemic, not simply collecting race-based data. For the court's understanding, the social determinants of health are socioeconomic factors that apply to a specific community or communities and impact their health outcomes. These factors include employment, policing, social supports, food security, and experiences of racism, discrimination, and historical trauma, including medical racism. The federal government has published a report that specifically tied racism to health outcomes for Black communities, given the confluence of all the factors I previously listed and more in the context of anti-Black racism. The federal government, municipalities, and community organizations have collected enough data to demonstrate that Black communities are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Black community members are much more likely, for example, to be frontline workers, such as grocery store clerks, personal support workers, and migrant workers. They are the ones who don't have the privilege of staying at home during stay-at-home orders. Black communities have been sounding the alarm about these issues since before the pandemic began, and now they're telling their elected officials that the pandemic is hitting them harder, as our friends have mentioned. It is not a particular quality of their race or ethnicity on a genetic level that COVID is having such an impact on Black communities. It is the social determinants of health that have been weaponized against Black communities because of systemic racism. The appellant has also provided significant evidence that demonstrates the impact of systemic racism on Black communities as they access healthcare in Canada. However, the appellant has failed to demonstrate that the collection of race-based data in itself will deal with these issues without further steps. While the respondent agrees that the federal government has a responsibility to correct these issues on a structural level, the respondent also submits that given what is already known, the minister is well equipped to address those further steps now. I will now move on to the respondent's second argument, which concerns logistical issues with data collection by themselves and in the context of a pandemic. Before you move on, Council, um, so you, you've spoken about the social determinants of health. You've told us that um, there's lots of information that communities have themselves come forward and provided, which the minister is taking, paying attention to and, and going to respond to. But isn't part of the minister's responsibility in terms of safeguarding the health of all Canadians, as you put it, rather than you know just one specific group, to make sure that the healthcare system that it funds can respond to the needs of specific communities. And without disaggregated race-based data, how will the minister fulfill her responsibility to specific communities who, as you acknowledge, suffer the effects of social, the social determinants of health? And it doesn't have to be that Mr. Williams is poverty stricken. It could simply be that he doesn't get the attention that he needs from his healthcare provider because they are not aware of studies um, that, that, that talk about how an illness may disproportionately affect one group or another. So, so please assist us in how the minister is going to do her work without that data. 
Justice, the minister does not object um, entirely to the collection of race-based data. What we want to point um, the justice's attention to is the fact that race-based data collection is a long process that cannot immediately address the needs that Black communities have been bringing to the minister since the pandemic began and before the pandemic began. A more direct approach that specifically addresses their needs is community consultation, where the federal government can specifically speak with communities, listen to them and respond appropriately in ways that bypass the, the issues with um, imposing an institutional data collection process that has issues, which will take time to resolve. Thank you. For my second argument, I will raise two points. First, that the collection of race-based data may unintentionally exclude communities by categorizing them inappropriately, which would defeat the purpose of data collection in the first place. And second, that Black patients have raised concerns about the collection of race-based data while they are seeking healthcare treatment and may be distrustful of an institution that is collecting the race data, as I mentioned earlier, an issue that the minister must address. To my first point, it has already been demonstrated that failing to properly categorize ethno-racial groups can negatively impact specific groups. For example, the respondent notes at paragraph 20 that in one US study, the high infant mortality rate among Hmong children, my apologies for the typo, isn't clear because they're lumped in with Asian children in general who have a relatively low infant mortality rate. This is one way that the collection of this type of data can have unintended consequences if it is not properly delineated. My co-counsel will speak more about the potential for this data to be misused and skew the medical response as certain diseases are tied to racial or ethnic groups, rather than looking at the socioeconomic and other social determinants of health that make Black communities vulnerable. Rather than focus on properly delineating a scope for data that won't be able to improve conditions immediately, the minister can use the data she already has, which shows that Black and other racialized communities are disproportionately affected by the pandemic and therefore implement, pol implement policies that address community needs. To my second just, point. Just before you move, just before you move on, I, I'm a just, little bit troubled. So the Minister of Health has collected some of this data. You've said they're, they're interpreting it. You've agreed that there is um, medical racism in terms of services provided. You agree that there are sometimes certain um, diseases or health vulnerable, vulnerabilities that are more common in particular um, cultures or races, but how does this all fall at the feet of Mr. Williams? Like, What is the answer here to improving the health policy? I mean, you say the health policy exists, but what is the answer to improve it? How do we get there? And why is it Mr. Williams' fault that the federal government is unable to properly obtain, gather, or assess the data? Justice, the data collection is one health policy, but the minister submitting that additional policies will be able to properly contextualize the issues of black communities because um, they're not a monolith. Mr. Williams, there's no fault of Mr. Williams for bringing this claim because he understands this issue to be that the minister is not does not care about, about black communities because their claim the appellant claims that the minister is not collecting this data. The minister has been collecting this data since since May of 2020. Um, the federal government has race based data that dates back to before Canada was even a country. It's at this point the minister needs to take the data which already exists and supplement it with community consultation as a way of better understanding the particular issues of Black communities and other communities so that she can create additional health policies that directly address the, the concerns that they have been raising since the pandemic. But as you've said, the race-based data has been going on for hundreds of years. There's also been community consultations going on for hundreds of years. And there's also reports, continued reports. We have reports coming out of the province of Ontario almost yearly in terms of um, different um, the effects of healthcare on different ethnic um, groups. So, so at what point is the government going to take the information they already have and act on it? 
That's what the government aims to do now by looking at how these issues specifically interact in the context of the COVID pandemic and how, for example, um, if we look at migrant farm workers who are predominantly black and brown, the government has responded to the outbreaks of COVID that have occurred at farms across Canada by consulting directly with these communities and determining how COVID has, be, has made them so, how, it, how the conditions they're living in have made them so susceptible to COVID. Although these are issues that have existed before the pandemic began, the pandemic is exacerbating them because they're, they've been there and the minister needs to respond to these issues now, particularly as they exist during COVID, which is a different situation, a more intense situation and requires the minister's attention. Thank you. Just one other question. I just it comes out of your fact I'm at paragraph 17. You talk about the fact that, and maybe this is not your, maybe this is for your colleagues, colleague to answer or respond to, but you indicated that the, you've just told us that the Minister of Health has acknowledged that there's an issue and a problem, and now they need to go about a consultation process. Um, in paragraph 17, however, you indicate that the minister would now have to dedicate resources to ensure that survey questions were accessible to Canadians. So I guess my question is what steps or what, what thought process is there with respect to like, how does this lack of understanding, again, like fall back at the feet mm -hmm. of the appellant or others from uh, similar backgrounds? Justice, would you mind clarifying your question? Certainly, if I read paragraph 17, your yes. paragraph in your factum suggests that there's a lack of understanding in questions posed by the minister. Yes. The minister, it's not the fault of communities that these questions are not understood. The minister needs to respond to communities in a way, in particularly with regard to the structuring of these types of questions so that the information that is gleaned from them is useful. For example, um, if, uh, if a question about um, race-based data does not allow individuals, for example, who have multiple ethnic backgrounds to properly indicate that they are from multiple ethnic backgrounds, um, they may choose one particular background that may skew the results, indicating, for example, that more or less black individuals ex um, live in a particular area. And so the minister can't properly respond if the information isn't accurate. And so given that properly delineating a scope and a procedure for this will take time, the minister should be focusing while that goes on in the background on policies that she can put into place and things that she can do right now that will address communities' needs so they don't feel as though they're being left behind simply because it takes time for data to be collected. All right, thank you very much. And council, I'm going to ask a question at this point. Yes, Justin. I asked your, uh, the appellants, isn't this really a political issue? Um, and I'm going to ask you the opposite because you appear to be saying that the political regime has been asking these questions and that they are collecting uh, the data in some form uh, and now they need community consultation. Um, we're in the middle of a pandemic where we're required to act quickly, and it seems to me that the political regime can't act quickly enough. So doesn't it require the courts to now intervene because we can answer the question now and make things happen today? Justice, the appellants are asking this court to mandate that the minister must collect race-based data, a procedure that is inherently going to take time. So even if the courts were to decide today that the minister must collect data, it's still, it's not an immediate solution. While data is being collected, people are being becoming sick and dying because the minister has to take time to collect information that black communities have been bringing to the federal government. At this point, the minister has acknowledged that the federal government has shortcomings and participates in the project of systemic racism and that they need to respond quickly to address the needs of these communities. Community consultation allows the minister and the federal government to do that because she can go and 
the minute the federal government can go and speak directly with communities and hear what issues are affecting them right now and institute policies right now. That is why that is a more viable option compared to collecting data that's not, that still requires additional steps after that data is collected before communities' needs can be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. To my second point um, about the logistical and practical issues with collecting race-based data, even if the categories and questions are set out comprehensively and effectively, the minister and the federal government has evidence that Black communities are skeptical about these types of questions when they're accessing healthcare. Many already know that their race or ethnic background has impacted the quality of their care, and the federal government has additionally collected data which indicates that Black communities have experienced discrimination while accessing institutional supports. So although hospitals, community organizations, and other government bodies have a role to play in the collection of race-based data, it cannot be the end-all solution because of this institutional distrust. In this pandemic, we have also seen the racialization of COVID to Chinese and East Asian patients in general, and the uptick of anti-Asian violence. So it is understandable that racialized patients and particularly black patients would have reservations about the government collecting this type of data when they've already been calling attention to healthcare related issues. Collecting data that will further demonstrate what patients already know is like saying the government must confirm what they're saying as if it's not enough to begin enacting health policies. Black communities deserve better and that is why the minister should prioritize direct action. This concludes my submissions onto the respondents' three theoretical arguments. I will now move on briefly to discuss the respondents' first doctrinal submission before turning it over to my co-counsel. The respondent submits that the appellant's section 15 right was not violated in this case because no distinction was created between the appellant and non-racialized groups. And if this honorable court finds that there was a distinction, it did not create an additional burden to the appellant. The respondent's analysis begins at paragraph 37 of the respondent's factum, <coughs> pardon me, where it follows the two-step test that was set out in law and then clarified in CAP. The respondent acknowledges that the appellants have followed the section 15.1 analysis as set out in Frazier, but the respondent maintains that the result is the same. There was no distinction, no differential treatment based on protected grounds through adverse impact as submitted by the appellants. The respondent's reasoning is the same for both tests, that the minister has begun has been collecting race-based data and coupled with community consultation, the information that she has, which will allow her to address black communities needs in a contextual manner, renders a, a section 15 challenge moot. The respondent also wishes to address the contention that section 15 places a positive obligation on the minister to collect race-based data for the purposes of substantive equality. The collection of race-based data in itself will not result in substantive equality. It is a tool which can be used to craft policies that center substantive equality. Moreover, the federal government has been collecting this type of data in many contexts. For example, looking at the mental health of racialized communities and the mortality rate of COVID in different ethno-racial neighborhoods. Without further action, the data itself is meaningless. Black patients who are ill from or susceptible to COVID will not be healed simply from having more data. And Justices, I noticed that my time is running out, so I will briefly conclude and rely on the respondents factum for the balance of my submissions. Justices, the federal government has race-based COVID data and it has research on how the social determinants of health make black and other racialized communities more susceptible to disease. The purpose in collecting race-based data is to indicate to the federal government what the issues are and how they can be addressed. If the federal government is already aware of these issues which have been raised by municipalities, health researchers, other organizations and communities themselves, what is needed in this moment is decisive action, not more data collection. If there are no further questions, my co-counsel will now address the remainder of our submissions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Justices, if you're ready, uh, the respondent is, thank you. Good, e good, good morning, Justices. My name is Sarah Khan, and I'm here on behalf of the respondent. 
The respondent's decision to not collect additional data with an unknown scope and methodology is grounded in light of the long history of systemic racism in Canada and the intense pressures of the current global crisis, especially on black and racialized groups. There is sufficient race-based data for the respondent to take public health measures. She must also consider other tools. If the minister was to collect additional race-based data, they must do so in a way that it provides additional insight into curbing the effects of systemic racism and the impacts of COVID-19. My co-counsel discussed the logistical challenges that contributed to less informative data. I will discuss how an unknown scope and methodology for collecting race-based data can have unintended consequences of harming vulnerable groups and perpetuating systemic racism. My first theoretical argument will explain how the collection of race-based data could entrench racism against Black Canadians. In my second theoretical argument, I discuss how race-based data can be repurposed for other studies that perpetuate medical and structural racism. I will be specifically uh, be talking about genome studies that look, as, that look at race as a biological determinant for explaining the disparities of health among racial groups. I then move on to my two doctrinal arguments. I argue that the respondent's refusal to collect more race-based data does not infringe on the appellant's section seven right of the charter. I then argue that if the honorable court determines the, that the respondent infringed on section seven and section 15 rights, the infringements are justifiable under section one of the charter. I then make my concluding remarks. To my first point, I start by discussing how the collection of race-based data can have unintended consequences on patients accessing healthcare and on racial groups having a prevalence of a disease. This argument can be found on paragraph 16 of the respondent's factum. Several countries around the world have an established practice of collecting race-based data on patients frequenting their healthcare system. The purpose of this data is to ensure that patients of all racial and ethnic backgrounds are receiving the full benefit of an accessible healthcare system. However, research has found that the process of collecting race-based data can have, can have the potential to harm medical patients. Justices, patients accessing healthcare often feel vulnerable because of their illness, disability, and social positioning. These factors are compounded for racialized and marginalized patients. UBC professor Colleen Varco found that racial surveys may use stereotypes and categorizations that distinguish racialized individuals from the norm. As a result, racialized individuals may feel judged because of their race, ethnic, and social conditions. The interactions between the patient and the healthcare staff could become more stressful for patients and they may actually have less access to healthcare resources because of negative stereotyping. During the study, one of the participants who identified as black expressed fear that survey questions could lead to discrimination and poor quality of care. Another participant who also identified as black stated that survey questions suggested that racism was being monitored. So these are perceptions that are subjective. However, their concerns are still valid. Varko pointed to another example that aboriginality can be pathologized as a risk factor for certain social problems. Furthermore, race-based data that shows a prevalence of a disease among racialized groups can perpetuate discrimination from the larger community. My co-counsel discussed that there was an uptick in discrimination against Asians in North America in the beginning of the pandemic. There has also been instances of rising xenophobia and greater surveillance of migrant farm workers from the Caribbean, Latin American countries, Jamaica, Trinidad, that work on Canadian farms. In the process of collecting new race-based data, the respondent must weigh the potential benefits with the adverse impacts. And I just Race have a question at this point, Council, because it seems to me that your positions may be inconsistent with your colleagues, because I, I had understood your colleague to say 
we don't need to collect this data because we're already collecting this data, be it through other avenues um, within the, the different layers of government, et cetera. Um, and if we started to collect this data, it takes time. So if we're already collecting it, it's not going to take time. If we're already collecting it, then aren't we aware of some of the issues you're, you're drawing us to at this point in terms of perpetuating further discrimination? And isn't there a way that we can address that? Thank you, Justice. So to your first point, uh, my colleague stated that uh, the respondent has already been collecting uh, race-based data. And that is true. That is with regard to the social determinants of uh, health. Um, the social determinants of health um, are some of the factors that have been studied before the pandemic. And as the respondent has been collecting data with regard to the outbreaks of COVID-19, those social inequities have been aggravating um, and driving the pandemic and disproportionately impacting uh, Black and racialized individuals. Now, with regard to collecting additional data, um, this point is with regard to uh, data that does not have a proper scope and methodology that hasn't been properly delineated at this point. And for that data to be collected, it must be done in a way that is comprehensive with proper cultural safeguards. Um, so, uh, and for, so the, my colleague and I, uh, we are essentially saying um, that this data will take time and it may not be here in time to save lives. And so the respondent must rely on other tools that could provide more contextualized approach. For example, community consultation that uh, looks at various factors that are um, socioeconomic factors that are impacting black and racialized groups. Thank you. So the respondent, oh, okay. The respondent must protect black and other racialized communities across Canada by ensuring that new race-based data does not replicate structural racism against vulnerable patients within the healthcare system. I now move on to my next theoretical argument found on paragraph 23 of the respondent's facto. The respondent agrees with the appellant that race-based data has a potential to provide valuable information on the impacts of the pandemic on Black individuals across Canada and on systemic racism. If the respondent is to collect additional race-based data, then the scope of data must be properly delineated with cultural safeguards. The respondent must also consider the potential of misuse of data, which can perpetuate racism. So one such example is the study of genomes that looks at race as a biological determinant to explain the disparities of health among racial groups. This argument can be found on paragraph 23 of the respondent's factum. The study of genomes can assist with rare hereditary diseases. However, there is no scientific consensus that race as a biological determinant can reliably explain the disparities of health among racial groups. This line of inquiry is gaining popularity despite inconclusive data. Some researchers are promising that genome study could give rise to personalized medicine that could accurately predict, diagnose, and treat illnesses among patients. Race as a biological determinant is not a reliable predictor of health because of large genetic variation within Black communities. Dr. Ratimi from Howard University's Human Genome Center pointed to the absurdity that somehow Black individuals, unlike their white counterparts, evolved into acquiring bad genes. According to Dorothy Roberts, uh, a scholar from Harvard University, pointed to uh, the fact that social determinants are a more reliable way of explaining the common diseases that are prevalent among certain racial groups. In the context of the global pandemic, social variables such as low income, education, overcrowded housing conditions, and precarious work are some of the factors that are contributing to the higher number of cases of COVID among Black Canadians. For these reasons, the Minister of Health must, must ensure that race-based data is properly designed to prevent reductive conclusions. This concludes my theoretical arguments. I now move on to my doctrinal arguments. Mm 
So before you move on to your doctrinal argument, I I'm trying to understand um, this, this um, exposition that you have with respect to um, biology. Isn't the appellant, the appellant, I, I don't read the appellant as asking for um, biological data to be taken, but rather that data be collected when an individual comes in contact with the healthcare system to indicate that individual's race. Uh, and as you have pointed out, counsel, their social uh, economic status, the type of work that they're doing, mm -hmm. those would also be helpful. If the minister has identified these things as drivers, it the court is trying to understand what harm would there be in the court ordering that this data be taken? Justice, the respondent is, is concerned about the potential misuse of data. Uh, the respondent understands the social determinants of health, but they also want, want to make sure that later on this data is not misused uh, and, and that it does not have the potential of harming racialized individuals. Um, so at this point, the, the respondent believes that they have enough information to go by to start implementing decisive public health measures with community consultation. However, in the future, when the respondent decides to collect additional data with a proper scope and methodology, they must consider uh, ways of ensuring that the data is not misused. Oh, yes, thank you. The respondent submits that their decision not to collect additional race-based data does not violate the appellant's Section 7 right under the Charter. And as such, the minister's decision was in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. This argument can be found on paragraph 29 of the respondent's factum. The respondent submits um, that the appellant's protected rights of bodily autonomy, physical and psychological integrity, and basic human dignity are, are being infringed by the pandemic and not by the respondent's uh, failure to collect additional data. The minister has an obligation under, mandate, uh, under her mandate of Department of Health Act under section four sub two to protect the health of all Canadians. The social determinants of health have been exacerbating the impacts of the pandemic on black and racialized individuals in Canada. So now is the time to take decisive public health measures to protect the life and liberty and security of the appellant and other Canadians. The divisions of power is an appropriate principle of fundamental justice. Although health falls within the provincial jurisdiction, the Minister of Health has a mandate to protect the health and interest of all Canadians. And under this mandate, um, she must ensure that she in enforces measures that stops the spread of viruses. She investigates and researches, uh, does a, conducts a research into um, a public health managers and to monitor diseases as is necessary for ensuring the protection of Canadians. The delineation of the collection of data falls within the ministerial discretion. The collection of race-based data is a method for the minister to research and to monitor the broader trends. However, race-based data is one of the several tools used by the minister to carry out her mandate to protect the health of all Canadians. Race-based data, as I mentioned, is one of the tools but it does not provide a comprehensive scope and she must still rely on other sources of information to understand the full scope of the issues that are faced by uh, black and racialized groups. Ministerial discretion is also consistent with the previous court's decision. Um, the Williams in Canada in the previous court did not delineate how the scope of collecting race-based data should be conducted and they left it to the respondent to create a scope uh, of collecting race-based data. The minister's discretion to collect additional race-based data with, falls within this principle of uh, divisions of power, which is a legal principle that is enshrined within the constitution. It has significant societal consensus 
It is also a manage manageable standard for measuring the protected rights under Section 7. It is within the minister's discretion to prioritize taking public health measures instead of collecting additional race-based data. Unlike race-based data, public health measures will make a difference in saving lives and protecting the lives of Black individuals. I will now proceed to my next doctrinal argument. The respondent submits that if the Honorable Court finds an infringement of Section 7 and Section 15 rights, then they are justified under Section 1 of the Charter. This argument can be found on paragraph 49 of the respondent's factum. In the first part of the Yokes test, the respondent submits that their objective was pressing and substantial. It is to preserve the health of Canadians living through the pandemic. Black individuals are at the forefront as they are disproportionately impacted by the crisis. The decision to refuse additional data was based on what is currently needed to respond to the crisis. In the second part of the Yokes test, the respondent submits that there was a rational connection between the objective of protecting Canadians' health and the minister's decision not to collect additional race-based data. The minister has prioritized public health measures that affect all Canadians while making public commitments to understand and address systemic racism as it operates in the Canadian healthcare system. The respondent is not disputing that the minister has to take action. She is disputing whether race-based data should be collected right now when a comprehensive methodology and scope of data has not been delineated. Furthermore, there is minimal impairment by the refusal as the minister has collected data on the impacts of COVID-19 on racialized Canadians and on social determinants of health. There are challenges to collecting useful race-based data. Data has already emerged on the social determinants of health and how COVID-19 has affected racialized people. Collecting more data is unlikely to reveal new information. Lastly, the respondent submits that the importance of the objective outweighs the limitation on the appellant's rights under Section 15 and 7. Public health measures are a priority because they will make an immediate impact on saving lives of Black and racialized individuals. In conclusion, we are fighting a global pandemic. The COVID crisis has disproportionately impacted the appellant because of systemic racism and the social determinants of health. The federal government has already been collecting race-based data in the context of the pandemic. The pre-existing social inequities and systemic racism have aggravated the impacts of COVID-19 on racialized and in particular Black and, indig and Indigenous communities. The respondent is relying on existing data to respond to the pandemic. Collecting new race-based data requires a careful review of scope and methodology that is culturally safe and comprehensive to ensure that new insights can be gained without causing undue harm to Black individuals. Developing a new... Oh, sorry, sorry. Council, I'm just going to stop you there again because, again, I think it, it seems to me that you're bringing up a timing issue again and and the fact that collecting this data is going to take time but then I go back to your friends arguments where they say listen other governments are already collecting this data so we have for example the United States is collecting this data England is collecting this data and then you've also told us that we're collecting this data in Canada in any event so I'm still I'm still stuck on why uh, this would be uh, justifiable under section one and saved under section one if you're saying we're already doing it, we can't do it in the manner that that's being suggested and yet we have examples really across the world and within our own country that this can be done. Justice. Um, the timing issue is with regard to what valuable insights can be gained at this point to respond to the COVID crisis that is happening right now. If we, if the respondent was to collect data, the in new insights may take time to uh, actually be valuable for implementing public health measures. 
So alternatively, the respondent believes that doing active community consultation will do a better job at looking at the various intersecting factors that are affecting communities individually. As my, my co-counsel um, uh, said, Black individuals across Canada are not homogenous. They're dealing with various uh, challenges uh, depending on the various socioeconomic factors. Um, so one example of this would be with migrant farm workers. Um, so migrant farm workers live in overcrowded housing conditions. Um, and that has been a problem since uh, the program began, uh, the, the temporary foreign work program began in 1966. Um, and so with those socioeconomic factors, the outbreaks have been, uh, uh, have been very common among farms. Um, and so at this point, the respondent is taking active measures to work with community organizations and to implement um, uh, uh, measures that would provide better housing conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one example. Uh, there's other challenges with collecting race-based data because it may not provide a comprehensive understanding of all the challenges that are being faced. Um, gov the, some individuals might have a deep distrust of the, the, the system and the government. Uh, for example, uh, within the Toronto neighborhood uh, where there's, they're planning on having a vaccine rollout, um, the, the Toronto mayor has acknowledged that there's a deep distrust of the government because of the long history of testing on, uh, on Black individuals. So, so if that's the case, how do we rely on the data that's already been collected to supplement our community outreach programs that you're suggesting? Justice, the, the data that we, the respondent has right now is on the social determinants of health and the various factors that are impacting um, marginalized individuals. Um, so that would mean um, the frontline, the overcrowded housing conditions, for example. Um, the fact that certain individuals are more like black women are more likely to be essential workers. Uh, and so they're more likely to be exposed to COVID. So that opens the door to understanding the various barriers and challenges that ind black individuals are facing at this time. And uh, this helps the respondent to take measures um, and address those specific barriers. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Just following up on my colleague's question and, and your response, you have, uh, it would appear, identified that economic factors and uh, immigration factors definitely weigh into uh, the government's, the minister's response. Mm -hmm. However, for those um, members of the Black community who perhaps are well off and show up at a hospital and are rejected on the basis of race, the minister has no evidence with respect to that by failing to collect race-based data. Justice, th that is an excellent point. So medical racism, the respondent acknowledges that there's medical racism in this country um, and that's affecting indigenous communities and, and, other, and black uh, communities as well. Um, so one of the strategies that the respondent is taking is um, doing community consultation um, to address these, the, the barriers that, the, that black individuals are facing. Um, so one example is through the anti-racism town hall meeting that was held uh, last year. Um, and the, one of the recommendations that were given at this time was uh, having a community-led uh, race-based data uh, to allow racialized and black individuals to uh, voice their concerns in a way that they feel comfortable. Um, and to also ensure that the um, individuals who feel, uh, who are distrustful of the government can still voice their concerns in a safe space. Thank you. Okay, so to conclude, uh, developing a new scope in the midst of a crisis may not provide new insights to mitigating harm to racialized individuals. So if the court has no further questions, these are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. As soon as the justices are ready, I can proceed with the appellant's reply. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
uh, one point regarding uh, my friend's submission um, regarding community consultation, as well as the alleged adverse impacts of collecting race-based data. Um, I would like to point to the, just, to the justices the uh, letter sent to the Ontario government, which we discuss at paragraph 33 of our factum. This letter was sent to the government in advance of them enacting their Anti-Racism Act, which I mentioned earlier in my submissions. And the letter stated that we cannot address what we cannot measure. And I'd also like to point the justice to the fact, and you can look at this if you like, the letter is hyperlinked in the reference section to our factum. The many Black organizations and I'm sure individuals who have signed on to this letter. So for example, the Black Gay Men's Network of Ontario, the Black Health Alliance, the Black Medical Students Association. And my friend asks for community consultation. Communities have requested, especially in Ontario, that the government collect this type of data and these are communities whose lived experiences, as my friend mentioned, of a, a, a lived experience of distrust of the healthcare system, of vulnerability and discrimination at the hands of the healthcare system. And they are asking that the government collect this data. Thank you. That is the appellant's reply, subject to any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.